Welcome to another episode of Living Fully Fit. I'm Coach AJ, a certified life and fitness coach, where we dig deep into different aspects of fitness, whether it's your relational fitness, your physical fitness, your spiritual fitness, mental and emotional fitness. And this segment is a special segment because I'm celebrating my 10 years in the United States Army. 10 years ago today, I joined the Army. I was going to basic training. And we're going to look at a segment that I'm entitling here, It's Never Too Late to Start Over. Because 10 years ago today, I was 31 years old, starting my career over from scratch, which was quite scary, quite ominous. And honestly, I didn't know what to expect. I spent 14 years in student ministry of doing the same thing and really loving what I did and not knowing what else to do. And I'm going to share my story in this segment. I'm going to go over the obstacles I experienced. I'm not going to go over over the entire story. I'm going to go over aspects and I'm going to be very vulnerable here about, you know, what I dealt with and what honestly caused me to join the army and leave student ministry entirely. A thing that I did for 14 years in different churches, different locations, different denominations, I had high highs and low lows and experiences, you know, up the wazoo, you never, tons of stuff that I experienced, you know, good, bad, and the ugly completely. And today's segment really is going to help you, encourage you to take risks, to listen to your gut, to listen to the people that are close to you, to listen to God even, because honestly, I'm going to tell you, my story is a tale of woe, a tale of honestly warning and to honestly to take that leap before it's too late. So I'm going to digress here. I'm going to go back for, backtrack a little bit to the past. So 10 years ago, I was in student ministry. I went to college for student ministry. I thrived in student ministry. I, every location I went to, we grew the ministry. You know, um, whether it was a, my first church was a actually Christian um, reformed church. And then I went to a more Southern Baptist, non-denominational style church. And then from, from there, I went to a Methodist church and then I went to a Presbyterian church. And then my last church was this, uh, little more on the charismatic side of non-denominational. And honestly, I look back now of what things happen, all the circumstances that occurred that led me to want to quit ministry entirely. Because honestly, I was fearful of leaving the ministry. And that's what really held me back was fear. I didn't know what else to do. I have, I did that career, that passion, my, my call for so many years. I didn't know what else I could do. I mean, I, I couldn't get in the business field. I tried that. It didn't work for me. And I remember at one point when I was, I was looking for a job, I tried applying to like, you know, Chili's and places like that. And they wouldn't have me. They're like, you're overly qualified. So I felt very stuck. That I'm not too sure where to go and what to do. And, you know, it took a lot of prayer and consideration. And my, my wife at the time, you know, she actually is the one that gave me the idea to join the army in the first place. Or the military. I tried the Air Force. They wouldn't have me. I was too old. I had 31 years old, right? But, you know, I look back now of what caused all those decisions. And I'm going to kind of go back a little bit further in time. So I joined the ministry back around 2006. Um, around 2006, I finished my degree and I got my first youth pastor job at this, you know, church over in spring texas and i enjoyed it i loved that first experience our youth our youth group met in this little trailer outside the church facility and you know it was my first experience as a youth pastor and i was it was a part-time gig i had a full-time job on the side um on the side but i had a full-time job you know i worked for toyota corporate over in houston texas and my experience was that I also had a, you know, also a part-time job doing youth ministry. That was my passion. I wanted to do it full-time eventually. And, um, I stayed there for a little bit and honestly it, it, the, there was no issues with the pastor or the leadership there. It just, I didn't see any really progression. I, I didn't see myself growing there fully. It was a good starting point, you know, a good launch pad for my ministry and for my career, but it wasn't where I was going to grow. 
and uh, opportunity came and I took the opportunity and I applied for another job and I got it. So I took the another, another part-time job as a youth pastor in another church where I, that was the first time I experienced some major church hurt. Long story short, what really happened was the pastor had basically kind of strong-armed me to kick two of my best volunteers out of the church, and I did not feel comfortable doing that. I honestly refused to do that. It, they were the, my best volunteers, and it was only because one of the parents, who was a big contributor, didn't like them. That was the main reason that he had me kick them out. And then, of course, you know, another thing that came into the, the board of elders and him was that, well, you didn't disclose that you were divorced. I'm like, well, why should I? That's not your business, but, you know, I think you could put two and two together. I have a son, you know, hello from previous relationship. Come on now. He's here all the time every other weekend. And so, you know, it was it was weird. And at one point, I remember the girl I was dating at the time. She was there with me and we had a meeting and he told her, well, you can stay, but AJ has to go. <laughs> and so I was the first like a bit of like a little bit of heartbreak. You know, it, I left um, no hard feelings. I didn't, I didn't feel upset about it, but you know what? God actually had opened the door pretty quickly right after around that time frame. My, my aunt had died. I went to her funeral and on the plane right back, I got a, you know, a text, actually email from a church saying that, they, Hey, they looked at my resume. They liked what they saw and they wanted to set up an interview. So I got a, a job interview with this Methodist church and I was there for a good, um, hour, uh, about a year and a half. And that went south too. Um, I had a very jealous youth assistant youth director or I guess associate youth director. She and I were kind of co-directors, but I guess I was the lead director. It was weird. Um, she was only there because she had been there for seven years and they didn't want to get rid of her, but also she never grew the ministry. Never, she didn't have any experience in it, didn't have a degree in it, nothing like that. Um, and I left that church also with, you know, a sour taste in my mouth. Uh, it really hurt me and broke me of how, how things went down there. And then I was applying for different jobs and I applied for a, a youth pastor job actually in Pensacola, Florida and beautiful location right on the beach, great benefits, great campus, huge church. But I met my future boss and this guy was a creep. And I, as soon as I met him, I was like, yeah, I'm not taking this. So I had another interview in Pittsburgh, where near my, my where my parents live actually, and it was that was kind of the okay. Well, my parents live only about an hour away from this church. It'd be kind of cool being near my parents. So, you know, I prayed about it. And we I took the job. My fiance now at that time, um, she finished college, and we were planning our, our wedding and everything. So I took the job there in in Pittsburgh was, and I was there three years. Three years of growing ministry. Um, my predecessor, great guy, but he just didn't grow that ministry. He was his focus was uh, uh, elsewhere, and I don't want to speak ill of him. He was he was a, he's a really guy, great guy, really nice guy. Um, but the church was very focused on how they did things. This is the way we do things. This is how it is. This is how our culture is in Western PA. And me being from Texas, not from Western PA, I was of the personality like, well, if it, just because it's the th way we do things doesn't mean, mean it's the right way to do things. And honestly, I was the person that was very against the system. And oh, I've always been that way. You know, if things don't make sense, why are we doing this? If it doesn't pass the common sense test, why are we doing it? And that's what I experienced with this church is I, I hit a lot of walls sometimes because people were so stuck in their old mentality and their old mindset and didn't want to, you know, play my game. You know, they didn't want to take a risk and, and do something different. And we grew that ministry from like, honestly, I, I had like, when I first got there about maybe 11, maybe 17 kids at max showing up on a good day, really good day, maybe 20. Um, but we grew that thing to the point we had like 80, 90 kids in our youth room on a Wednesday night. It was crazy, but it wasn't just the numbers. It was the impact. How many kids were saved? How many kids gave their life to Christ? How many kids really got the message and then served the community? We did so many community outreach pro pro um, programs and events where we mow people's lawns and just did random acts of kindness and we would do. Uh, we would go to the nursing home every year and spend Christmas there and do like gingerbread house decoration. Just spend time in the community. We did a lot of that, 
But what really was funny towards the end of my ministry there, it was I was getting chastised for the dumbest things. Uh, I got accused of lying about the numbers of how many kids we had there, which I'm like, I'm not lying because I don't do head count. My volunteers do the head count and I have another person have all the kids sign in. So I'm basing off of a head count and a sign in sheet, sign in roster. So um, where am I lying? So I was accused of that. I was accused of you not being a team player because I didn't spend my free time volunteering in the other ministries where the funny thing is the other ministries never volunteered to help the youth ministry. So it was like a, a one way street, you know, so all these little things added up. And finally, was, what was sad is the elders, when they met with me, they were kind of split. Half the elders loved me. They saw what I did. They saw my heart. They, they knew me. And even when my volunteers, he came in and spoke on behalf, my behalf and just actually cried to the elders like, hey, this guy's doing great stuff. Stop it, you know. Um, and I remember finally, unfortunately, the, the elders voted and, and it wasn't unanimous. It was a split vote. And then the pastor had the final vote and I was voted out. So I left the day I left, I broke down crying. I st stood there in front of my youth and said, Hey, just want to let y'all know this is my last Wednesday night with y'all. And I just cried bald like a baby. Um, those kids, I, I seen, I saw a lot of them grow up from middle school up into high school. I saw them grow up into young men and young women doing great things. And it was so heartbreaking. You know, they were there for my baby reveal party when my when my daughter Emma was born. You know, they were there for when she was a baby. They helped hold her and raise her. We went to mission trips and mission camps and been through ups and downs and all kinds of stuff and cool trips and saw amazing stuff. We coined the word, the phrase youth family there to the point where when we went to youth events, I'd have like people in the staff like, is this your youth group? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, this is my youth group. What do they do? Oh, they're great. They just love on each other. I've never seen a group like this. Like, oh, thank you. That's great. Um, so it was so heartbreaking to me. And you know, it was funny. As I was leaving that church in Pittsburgh, um, the one of my volunteers said, AJ, I think, I think you need to take a step away from ministry for a bit. I think you need to take a break. I think this really broke you. And my wife at the time also told me, hey, why don't we just – go back to Texas and you take a break from ministry. I'll just work. We can live with my parents and figure it out. You know, I don't know. We'll just take a break from ministry. And, you know, and then one of the associate pastors, um, this guy named George, a great guy too. And he said the same thing to me. He's like, you know, you should just take a break, man. Just like this really hurt. I could tell this hurt you. I could tell this broke you. Maybe God's telling you to take a knee. And I, I didn't listen to any of them. I just like, well, no, no, no. This is all I know. This is a mystery. So I took, I put my resume out there and I got a job offer, you know, and I, I took it, you know, um, got back to Texas. Um, and I wish looking back now that I would listen to them. Um, I took this job in Texas at this church outside of Houston. And at first, you know, I, I came back thinking I'm okay. I'm not broken. My heart's not broken. I, I'm fine. I'm healed from the last church that really hurt me. You know, it's okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Got in there and you know what was interesting is I had all the signs when I was interviewing for the job. <laughs> My interview, the pastor had kind of laid down what he's what he can pay what they can pay me. And it was about a ten thousand dollar decrease from what I was getting back in Pittsburgh with no benefits either. The the church in Pittsburgh, I was getting full benefits. The church in Texas, which was a lot larger of a church, it was a mega church, you know, not mega, mega like, you know, Joel Osteen, but it was a pretty large church. It was a very large church in the, for that community. And they paid, the, the offer he offered me was like, I think around about 28K. Um, and I was like, okay, um, well, <laughs> I I don't know. I said, that's, that's a big decrease. And he's like, well, how about this? If you increase the youth ministry, I will give you a 10. If you double double the size of the youth group, I'll give you a $10,000 a year raise. I'm like, okay, done deal. I can do that. So that was motivation. We moved, got there, settled in. And there were just a lot of different circumstances that happened throughout the time. My wife at the time and I, we just, we just fought a lot. There was just a lot of discord. I think there was a lot of personal hurt and church hurt. And back then I was prioritizing and work over my family and it bled into our, our family. And there was just a lot of other factors that, you know, that went into the whole situation. You know, we just didn't, 
we fought a lot. There was just a lot of things, you know, things that she, she hurt me a lot. And I, I felt that, you know, and I, and I hurt her too, because, you know, I was prioritizing the church over my family. And in the end, you know, what, what really transpired, I was there for a couple of years, about two and a half years. We did, again, I doubled the ministry, didn't get the raise. He reneged on that deal. He told me he never, he, he never said that. Of course he didn't, you know, of course. Yeah, sure. Um, there were a bunch of other instances in that church where I lost my friends. They left the church because of, of this pastor and his leadership style, very toxic leadership, very narcissistic, very just he, his way the, or the highway, no accountability, no real elder board that kept him accountable. He just did what he wanted to do. I saw a lot of crooked stuff behind the curtain of that ministry. That's, and that's for our story. But in the end, you know, I still never dealt with that pain and hurt, and I didn't know what else to do with my career in ministry. And what ended up happening is it really affected everything. I was starting to drink heavy in youth ministry to the point where I, I, I drank almost every other day. And I came home to a wife that we just fought all the time and just I was miserable. I went to work where I was miserable. My pastor told me I was allowed to have friends. Word for word, he told me I was not allowed to have friends in the church because I was a pastor and they're my subordinates and I, I cannot have friends in the church. So I felt very isolated. It's like the guy isolated me. I put, put myself on the island and I felt very alone. And with that comes problems. When you don't listen to God and you don't listen to his spirit and when you Honestly, isolate yourself and put yourself in a vulnerable situation, bad things happen. And that's what happened to me. I was very vulnerable, very vulnerable indeed. And what ended up happening is this girl, random, you know, lady came into my life. Not a girl, a lady, adult woman. Came into my life and, you know, at first it was just a friend. Friend turned into more. And I caught, got caught myself into a whole whirlwind of trouble with a affair within the church while I was a youth pastor, while I was preaching, while I was doing that stuff. And my God, what, what was I thinking? You know, if I would have taken that knee back in Pittsburgh and taken a break from ministry, maybe joined the army back then or did something different, I wonder where things would have been now. You know, and there's not a lot of, I don't, I don't believe in the what ifs. I don't believe in that. But I do believe what kept me in that situation was fear and stubbornness. Fear and stubbornness. And I got caught up in this affair that not only wrecked me, but it wrecked the people I love. It wrecked my family. It wrecked my ministry and my legacy. Every amazing thing I did in ministry mattered not. It was destroyed because of my actions. Because honestly, it started off with my stubbornness and my fear. That's what happened. Because I was stubborn and didn't want to listen to all these people give me the advice, hey, take a break, you're broken. Hey, take a break, you're broken. Hey, take a break, you're broken. Then guess what? When you're broken and you don't listen, then sin creeps in. And other things creep in. I had, I was dealing with porn. I was dealing with alcohol. I was dealing with all these issues. And then it led to an affair, you know, all these things that honestly, in the end, my fault. I did that myself. You know, no one made me do that. I chose that route, unfortunately. And it caused me everything. I lost everything. I could have started over on my own accord, but what, what propelled me to start over was that. Now, granted, it didn't, that didn't come out until after I had enlisted. So I had a, around like September of 2013, I already started talking to a recruiter. I was getting ready to get out of the ministry. And during that time frame, I was still having this affair. On and off, though, I was like, one day I'm like, no, this stops. We're ending this now. And I would end it. And then, you know, I'm... Um, a few weeks later, it started again. And it was like this ongoing thing because I knew it was wrong. I had this guilt. I had this shame. And it was just wrecking me. And then, you know, I finally got the call to ministry. I mean, out of, the, out of ministry, I got the call from my recruiter that everything was good. My packet was good to go. And I was set to go in March to basic training. Um, I ended the affair. And then, and then... You know, hoping to, you know, kind of pick up the pieces of the mess I made. 
you know, try to keep, fix my marriage, fix my, my, my relationship with my daughter. Cause I was a terrible dad back then because I was so focused on my work and my career and ministry, ministry. Unfortunately, it wasn't ministry. It was busyness. It was a business. The church back then I was at was a complete business and they ran me ragged. I was working 80 plus hours a week and paid less than a preschool teacher with a with a four-year degree, 14 years in ministry experience, and paid and treated like junk. And honestly, I just kept doing it because it's what I was familiar with. And that led to this spiral of shenanigans that led me to poor, poor decisions, poor choices, and where I'm at. But honestly, what saved me was taking that leap. Finally going to basic training, signing that contract to say, I'm joining the Army. Honestly, if it wasn't for that leap, that t- you know, overcoming that fear of something different, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't be the warrant officer that I am today, and in, within ten years of the of the army, you know, I attribute the success and the growth in my life to being obedient to God. It took me to being obedient to leaving that that stupid relationship I had that with that person. Unfortunately, it was too late because my wife found out while I was at basic training and filed for divorce while I was at basic training. So talk about you're already in a stressful environment in basic training and you find and you find out that your wife found out about the affair. That was rough. You know, I felt such guilt and shame to the point where I there were thoughts in my in my mind, of course, you know, but you know, I didn't let those thoughts control me. Luckily, the army is so good about surrounding you with good people. And good resources. I had an amazing chaplain who just rallied around me and walked me through it and counseled me through a lot of it. I saw a counselor for the first time in my life. It was healing, you know, and I look at that now. If honestly, if I would have listened, if I would have listened and paid attention to all those people coming in my life, and I think it was God sending them, I think it was God telling them to tell me, look, If you continue this path, you're going to spiral. You need to take a break. You are hurt and broken. You need time to heal. And I didn't do that. I was just so stubborn and fearful. And when you combine stubbornness and fear, you're going to miss out on your opportunity. You're going to miss out on your purpose. You're going to miss out on your path. You're going to miss out on what God really has for you. That's the thing is if you are so stubborn and so fearful to take a risk and take a leap to take that chance of your life to do something different, whether it's a relationship, maybe it's a relationship, maybe you're in a toxic relationship and you don't know what to do, but you're you're stuck in it. Well, you know, if I leave this person, what am I going to do? I'm going to be alone. If I leave this person, what's going to happen to me? If I leave this person, what are people going to think of me? Well, is this healthy? Are you going to be in a better situation or are you going to find yourself in a worse situation? Or if it's a job, you know, well, if I leave this job, what else am I going to do? I don't know. Learn something, learn a new trade, learn a new skill, join the military, something. There's something out there for you. And I wish I would have learned that early on. I wish I would have taken that risk then, that I would have saved my, my poor daughter being in a broken home. You know, I was saved my, my, my family from being, from the shame that I caused. I would have saved them from a lot of shenanigans. You know, I look back now and it's like, geez, if I would have just learned all this stuff. I was just paid attention and taking a little bit more risk, not in my family, but taking a risk on myself and say, you know what this? Yeah. I, I know about ministry, but you know what? I know God has a better plan. God's going to provide and I can do something. That's what I should have done. I didn't do that. I didn't listen. I didn't pay attention. I was just stubborn, but overall I was fearful, you know, um, New taking a new career and leap in life is hard, you know, it really is. But if you think about it, fear leads to something else. It, yeah, I don't want to be cliche, you know, one of my favorite movies is Star Wars. For those who know me really well, Star Wars is one of my favorite movies. And it's funny, you know, Yoda, the character Yoda says this phrase, you know, fear leads to anger, anger leads to fear, An- fear leads to s- and anger leads to suffering, and so on and so forth. And you think about it when it comes to like fear in real life, fear could lead to sin. Can Fear can lead to you fill in the blank, not good stuff. You know, when you let fear overcome your life and not propel you in a good direction to change your trajectory, you're going to find yourself in positions you wish you weren't in. 
And that's what happened to me. You know, I let fear drive me. And I know a lot of leaders who let fear drive them. I know a lot of leaders who are afraid to just be transparent and open and honest and say, you know what? I screwed up. Yep. I I'm, I have an addiction to porn or I have this issue here or whatever it is in being honest and transparent with their subordinates, with their congregation or whatever it is to the point where they're, they can find healing and restoration in that. But rather they would hold on to their power, hold on to their clout, hold on to what's familiar and they don't progress. They don't grow as a person. And honestly, that was me. I was guilty of that. I was that stubborn. I was, I was guilty of that person that honestly, I didn't see myself. With, uh, nothing's wrong here. Nothing to see here. I'm good. I just need, I just need to find another church to be a pastor at. No, I need to take a break. I need to find restoration and heal and heal the wounds that, that I saw my, from my past. I need to heal all the brokenness and the church hurt I experienced because I was very vulnerable for attack. I was very vulnerable for temptation and I didn't see that. And that honestly, the, the whole premise of me telling you this story, which is honestly, it, this is my first time ever doing this story on one of my podcasts or sharing this story online because it's it's very vulnerable to me. You know, it's a very serious situation. It's a very personal situation for me. But this situation is what made me the person I am today. I'll tell you this, me taking that leap of faith and joining the army and leaving ministry behind was the best thing for me. It gave me the break, a break from ministry, but it also gave me a way to really heal, give me the resources I needed. Because I wasn't getting those resources in the church, which is sad. You think the church would have those resources. Some do. There are some churches that are great about that, rest, restoring people. But the churches I was at, unfortunately, were not about that. They weren't about restoration. They're about kicking you out and kicking to the curb and good luck. You know, I see a lot of churches that are like that today. But, you know, the sad reality is, you know, it could have been, it could have been prevented. I could have prevented all that what, that happened to me and my family. Because when you don't listen to the call on your life, when you don't listen to people giving you the warning signs, it doesn't just hurt you. There's collateral damage you have to consider here. And that's what happened when you don't look at you know, the aspects of your life when you're living in fear, when you're living with uncertainty and you just stay where you're comfortable because it's all you know, then you run the risk of collateral damage. It's not just about you, especially since I was a husband and I was a dad. It wasn't about me, but I made it about me and look what it got me. You know, but luckily, you know, God restores and heals. And you know what's funny is this is a beautiful story that happened to me. This is real. So when I was in basic training, we were in the field. It was our it was our FTX field ex exercise. It was the last one of the basic training. Um, and we were out, you know, doing coverage. It was like late, late at night, early morning, around like 2 a.m. And I was pulling guard. And it was just, I was the only one awake. Everybody's asleep, even though they're pulling guard. And I'm just sitting there. I'm praying to God because, you know, I was still just dealing with all this, the reality of being divorced, the reality of losing my daughter and having to have to share her. It was just real. And I'm sitting there and I'm talking to God. And as clear as I can hear anyone else's voice, I heard this voice. And it just said this, I will restore the broken. It gave me cold chills. It still does to this day. And, you know, at first I was like, oh, God's going to restore my broken marriage. He's going to fix it. He's going to make sure I don't get divorced. That's how I interpreted it at the time. But then as I see my life progress in the last 10 years, this last decade, I realized this. He wasn't talking about that. He wasn't talking about my marriage. He was talking about me. I will restore your broken heart. I will restore the brokenness that you dealt with. I'll restore your broken sin. I will restore you, AJ. Because I have so much more for you. And honestly, being obedient and staying in the fight with the army has been the best thing for me. I've been able to heal and grow and see great things and, and travel the world and see beautiful countries and have experience and meet amazing people and influence way more people than I did in ministry in a different position. Because I don't do ministry. I don't, I'm not a chaplain's assistant. I'm not a chaplain. 
What I do now in the Army is I do human resources. But guess what? I get to be around people daily where I get to have a positive influence in their lives. Was I always perfect about that? No. But I've learned that more and more as I've progressed in the last 10 years. And where I'm at now, 10 years since since I joined, I look back and I see the amazing potential that I could have had if I would have started this a long time ago. Um, and you know, that's the thing is, you know, when you live in fear, you miss out on potential. When you live in fear, you miss out on that purpose. You miss out on what could be in your life, on great things, doors that can be, are wide open for you to cross through the threshold, but you're holding yourself back because of fear, because of complacency, because of shame, maybe because of stubbornness. So long story short, I'm going to tell you this, is if you learn nothing else from my story except that it's a story of, of stupidity, because that's, that's what I was, learn this is that if you are stuck, maybe you're, you're stuck in a relationship, maybe you're stuck in an organization, a job, maybe you're stuck in a location, maybe you're stuck in a church that isn't healthy for you, in a situation, a group, a group of people, maybe our family, whatever it is, you feel stuck. You feel alone. It's toxic. It's not helping you. You feel broken. I'm going to tell you right now, do not let fear hold you back from the best version of you, from the potential of what you could be and where you could be. If you've learned nothing from my message, learn that. Because I regret so much. The biggest regret I have is the fact that my poor choices had so much collateral damage. Because think about this, 14 years of ministry, I reached a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids for Jesus. And in one poor decision like that, I lost my credibility, my reputation, and a lot of my legacy. I could have kept the legacy I had and all those good things I did meant nothing because I messed it up very quickly because of fear and stubbornness, which led to stupidity and making poor, definitely poor decisions for my life. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave you with this. Thank you for listening to this. It's, 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 hard, it's a hard story. It's hard for me to tell it. But I'm going to tell you, the reason why I'm sharing this is because I want you to learn from it. Don't learn from your own ch poor choices. Learn from someone else's. That way you don't repeat those things. And what you can learn from this is learn to grow, learn to take risk, learn to listen to the people in your circle. If everybody's giving you a warning of something, it's probably a legitimate warning. If everybody's telling you, hey, you know, this is there's something wrong here. This doesn't feel right here. Look at this. But you're like, nothing to see here. No, 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 no. I ignore that. Pay attention to the signs. I'm not a signs person at all. I don't think, you know, there's all these little signs. Oh, God, give me a sign. I don't think there's a lot of that. But when multiple people tell you, hey, you know, I could tell you're, this is affecting you. You should probably do something. Listen. Especially the people that love you. Especially the people that have good will towards you and think good of you. Don't listen to just anybody, but listen to the people that you actually care about, the people who are, you know, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally mature to give you, to speak life into you. So just keep that in mind as well. But I'm going to leave you with this. As I close here, and my closing remarks to this podcast is simply this. Take risk. Take the leap of faith. Learn from my mistakes. Because for me, 10 years down, the, 10 years later now, I am in an emo the most amazing spot in my life where I have an amazing relationship with my kids. I met this beautiful woman who's my fiance now. Um, and then I have amazing friends, amazing experiences. My walk with Christ is probably the strongest it's ever been, even when I was in ministry, which is crazy. But I've learned so much in those 10 years. The biggest lesson I've learned is humility. You can be confident but be, be humble as well. You can be confident, but you have to be willing to look at yourself in the mirror and be willing to say, you know what? There's something I need to fix here, something I need to address here. When you do that, you're taking care of yourself. You're taking care of your mental health, your emotional health, and all the other aspects. 
You will never grow if you don't be, if you're not honest with yourself. You'll never grow if you don't overcome that fear and you push away that stubborn mentality. Anyways, hopefully this was helpful for you. I know for me, I've learned a lot in my 10 years in the army, 10 years of, of life coach. Well, now life coach, I've been life coach for the next last three years now. And I've learned so much, so many lessons, so much in my experiences with people and life and everything. And what's funny is 10 years later, I still have a lot of relationships with a lot of my old youth kids and they're all adults now, which is crazy. And some of them knew what happened. Some of them don't. And, you know, probably will now, but you know, it's God restores the broken. That's the most beautiful message that I can leave you with. God will restore, restore the broken. He restored me, and here I am, standing and still growing. But anyways, thanks for watching another episode of Living Fully Fit. I'm Coach AJ, your certified life and fitness coach, but mainly your transformation coach, where my role really is to help you grow into the best version of yourself in every aspect of fitness. If you like content like this, make sure to go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel. If you want to see more content just like this, every week it's a different subject, a different theme, but either way, it's a different way to help you transform your life to be a better version of you. And if you know anyone who can benefit from content like this, make sure to go ahead and share this link as well. Thanks for watching.